Okay, I think uh, we are ready to start. Welcome, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today for Neuroelectrics webinar. My name is Rafa Novak, and I will be your host today. So this is the sixth of series of Neuroelectrics webinars, and now we have already more than 100 participants online. Today we'll be talking about how to activate, modulate, and reorganize brain and spinal networks in order to restore motor function in people affected by neurological disorder, such as, such as spinal cord injury or stroke. I'm very happy to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Mar Cortez. Good morning, Mar. Hi, how are you? Uh, yes, we are fine, thank you. And uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, we'll begin with Mar's presentation with duration of approximately 40 minutes. This will be followed by questions and answers period. So please uh, feel free to submit your questions at any time using the chat tool. And for your information, the recorded version of this webinar will be also available offline. So please uh, let me quickly introduce our speaker, Professor Mark Cortez. Mar is a professor of rehabilitation medicine in the Department of Rehabilitation and Human Performance at the Icahn School of Medicine and Mount Sinai in New York. The primary goals of Dr. Cortez's research are to understand neural plasticity and its clinical implication to develop novel individualized rehabilitation strategies to promote motor recovery and improve quality of life for patients with mobility impairment. She couples state-of-the-art robotic technology and non-invasive brain and spinal stimulation techniques to understand the mechanism of motor dysfunction and improve motor control. So obviously a lot of shared interest with us here at Neuroelectrics. So welcome, Mar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, to everybody that is here to share in this, uh, this uh, moment with uh, us. I, uh, I hope that I will make it uh, interesting and very stimulating. That's the goal. Um, and thank you for the very kind um, introduction. You say so many things that I, you know, now I, I am speechless. Um, so maybe a little bit about me before I get started. Um, I am a PM&R doctor by background, but um, almost 12 years ago, I started my path um, as a scientist, I had um, way too many questions to, um, to, um, that I couldn't answer, um, and my patients were left uh, still with a lot of disability despite um, everything that was going on in medicine and in science. So I decided to move um, first to Boston and then to, um, to Mount Sinai here in New York um, to try to investigate better how the human brain works, right? Um, so I am the co-director of the Abilities Research Center. This is um, a very nice picture of, uh, of New York City. That's Manhattan, that's the view from, um, from the Dean's office. That's definitely not the view from our office, for our center. Um, but one day we'll have such a beautiful view. So um, let me just uh, maybe tell you a little bit what is that we are doing here. Um, in the Abilities Research Center, we're trying to um, to do three different things. One is to understand brain and spinal plasticity after any kind of neurological damage. We're trying to develop new strategies uh, to address uh, any consequences after a neurological injury. And, um, and we are also trying to be a place um, where um, we can accelerate the path of neural technologies from the, from the beginning, from the scientific concept to the mainstream clinical adoption. So that's in a shell what is that uh, we are aiming to do. Let me introduce you to our, our amazing team. Um, we have from uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, neuroscientists, uh, doctors. Um, what else? What else? Well, we have artists. We work with a very, it's a very biomedical engineers, it's a very multidisciplinary team uh, and we have multiple collaborators because we have realized that um, um, if we want to, uh, to really address these very complicated questions, um, we need to put our brains together. So um, I'm very, very interested about the creative process. And before I start with my, with my talk, um, this um, beautiful artist, Javi Royo, um, he has, uh, a very, very funny um, Instagram page. He described very well how the creative process is. You have a great idea, 
um, it goes through a phase that uh, hmm, you say it's good, it's bad, it's good, it's bad. You have the deadline for the project delivery. Suddenly um, you go to the shower and ta there you have uh, your, uh, your fantastic idea. So in all this process, it's uh, what we are doing here in the center. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we integrate these uh, brain stimulation devices with, uh, with motor recovery uh, in our center. So in our center, one of the things that we always say, and, uh, and the other uh, director of the center, Dr. David Petrino has a TED talk explaining very, very well this, we treat our patients like if they were superheroes. So um, we believe that rehabilitation, as I say there, it's a performance training and our patients are our champions. So um, um, here at the center, we work with some of the best athletes in the world, and we are trying to understand what it's that makes them exceptional and how to make them better. So the same thing we do with our patients. Let's get started um, with um, what is motor recovery and, uh, and uh, neuroplasticity. So many of you might know that uh, when we have, a, I'm gonna give two examples, like the two main examples of patients that we treat here and uh, the two lines of, uh, of research that I usually do. One is a spinal cord injury, the other one is a stroke. In the spinal cord injury, as you can see um, here, um, usually uh, it's a traumatic event that uh, it can result in, a, in an alteration of the normal sensory, motor, and the autonomic uh, function. And uh, these changes are gonna really have a very um, psychological, physical, and social impact in our, in our patient. So this disruption between the connections of the brain and the muscles are what is gonna create all of these changes. Um, there are multiple systems that they are affected. That's why they, are, they have been for, for recovery of the motor function after the spinal cord injury, many diversity of approaches from stem cell, uh, stem cell research to um, to robotic training with exoskeletons, right? And everything in between. Um, so the problem usually is um, people with this spinal cord injury are left with incomplete recovery of the motor function. They are left with a huge um, increase of the neuropathic pain and with the spasticity. When the motor um, function is recovered, we call it that um, adaptive plasticity. When uh, that it's when um, those um, axons that they have left um, spare after the lesion, the descending pathways, um, they start growing and they go where they are supposed to go. That is to the muscle to get innervated. When that axon doesn't go uh, there, we um, assume that that it's a process of maladaptive plasticity, and it leads to pain and spasticity. We do know that um, after the stimulation of uh, the nervous system, um, after injury, sorry, uh, if you stimulate the nervous system, we can augment plasticity of these spare or, or latent circuits um, through focal modulation. So there are many different types of, uh, of modulation of, or, or stimulation. And uh, in this uh, schematic here, I just wanted to, uh, to divide it by location. So, there are different approaches that uh, they are modulating the motor cortex, such as the repetitive TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation. That the bulk of my talk is gonna is gonna I'm gonna be talking about this this approach, theraverse the stimulation, um, uh, the pair associative stimulation or PAS. Uh, that uh, it's just. Uh, putting together afferent stimulation with TMS. Um, we can also modulate or stimulate directly um, the spinal cord with transspinal direct current stimulation, non-invasively, with epidural stimulation um, invasively, or with spinal associative stimulation that is also um, combination between um, afferent stimulation and central stimulation colliding those, um, those um, to stimulation bolus at the spinal cord level. Um, and then we can also stimulate the muscle level, right, with, uh, with FES, the functional electrical stimulation, tense of we motor skill training. And with motor skill training, what everybody thinks about is physical therapy. Here in our, in our center, 
we are very big in, in trying to bring technology into rehabilitation. So even to do physical therapy, we use um, robotic devices. And I will explain a little later why is that. Um, when we um, think about the, uh, the stroke or brain stimulation and stroke rehabilitation, the concept is uh, it's similar. Um, we have uh, in the side of the brain that had a stroke in the affected hemisphere, we know that uh, there is a decreased excitability of the whole hemisphere and there's an augment or increased excitability in the hemisphere that didn't have the stroke. So um, scientists, they have been devoting a lot of their time and efforts in trying to, in, to balance it out, this, this balance of, uh, of excitability in between the two hemispheres, right? Um, so here we have uh, um, different approaches that will create increase of the, of the excitability in the brain, such as a high frequency repetitive TMS, uh, intermittent therapeutic stimulation, and another TDCS. Um, in the contrary, if we want to stimulate the unaffected hemisphere, that is the one that has more increased excitability, we will be using low frequency uh, RTMS, continuous steroid stimulation, or cathode uh, TDCS. But uh, what is really neuroplasticity? I, I believe that uh, as a clinical scientist, we, for me, it's very, very important to go to the basis because if we understand how the neural structure works, um, then it's gonna be much easier for us to adapt for each patient what the needs are uh, and do a more personalized kind of treatment. Since we have like these novel techniques now that we can use such as um, non-invasive brain stimulation. So when I talk about neuroplasticity, I, I'm referring uh, to the basis of, uh, of motor recovery, right? Um, we do know um, in this, um, in this uh, beautiful schema that Carmichael um, published in 2010 uh, that uh, neuroplasticity is the ability of this nervous system to respond to either intrinsic or extrin extrinsic stimuli. Uh, and then it will reorganize its structure, the function and the connections. This neuroplasticity can be triggered by an injury, but also by activity or training, okay? Um, so, uh, Nudo and, uh, and collaborators, they, um, they um, uh, published this paper um, that it was seminal for us to know that um, in order to, uh, to create a reorganization of the cortical map, so a create a, in order to create a change in the brain to promote plasticity, you need to do rehabilitation. You really need to do an active training. Passive movements um, will not determine these kind of changes. So knowing all of these things that we know about how biology and neurophysiology works, the other part of the puzzle that we need to understand is what do we need to do for that training to work, right? If we really want to promote this plasticity. Because as we have seen so far, um, we can just uh, um, promote that neuroplasticity with activity. Uh, without even using um, the brain stimulation. So as always, once you put together two different approaches, you need to understand both independently and then together because what you apply when and the dose and everything is gonna have an impact. Um, so very, very important and very quickly, I'm gonna um, just go through the, the key factors of motor recovery during training. Uh, so we know that um, when we do, um, after having a motor dysfunction, after a spinal cord injury, after a stroke, MS, any ne neurological disorder, um, we are gonna need, it's gonna be very, very important to know how this therapy needs to be. We do know that the therapy needs to be intensive, needs to be active and challenging for recovery to take place. Um, new technologies that they are like coming out now have many advantages for application in this kind of, uh, of treatments. Uh, they can provide like a more intensive and longer trainings and they can adjust to the individual patient and level uh, of, uh, of enhancing the, this capacity for recovery. Um, the practice of the training, it should be scheduled efficiently. This means that it needs to be done early um, after the injury 
it needs to be in a task specific um, um, variable matter and it has to be related to activities of the daily living um, we do know that uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of times or now more and more more uh, research studies they are getting into uh, what are the psychological factors that determine how the training can be better and we know that motivation it's a it's a big thing that's why now a lot of the um, a lot of the um, um, robotic therapies they use gaming virtual reality we're going to be talking about these things um, what is the problem here the problem is is that despite um, everything that we know all the advances in medicine all the advances advances in pharmacology all the advances in in, in how to take care of these kind of patients early on uh, so they don't die right after the injury like it happened before for example um, with people with a spinal cord injury um, this is still a need for novel approaches since the current ones they still leave people with uh, with disabilities so uh, here well, it comes the, the novel technologies um, there are many things that they are coming up, but um, to me, um, here group are, right now uh, we're about to uh, to submit a, a review about what are the you know the technologies, what are the approaches for uh, for motor recovery in upper extremity in people with a spinal cord injury, and some of the the more validated approaches are the ones that they are here um, in your screen. So we do have uh, TDCS. I will say not only TDCS, but non-invasive brain stimulation. I will put TMS in here too. Uh, it's a safe and non-invasive technique that can modulate cortical excitability. More and more um, um, approaches now, they are using virtual reality, not also for, for motor recovery, but also for uh, for decrease of neuropathic pain. Um, they are using like this uh, virtual reality and an enhanced reality um, just uh, to do uh, movement therapy. Um, then we have the sensor technology, um, uh, motion um, um, sensors, uh, force sensors, just to uh, to assess and also to enhance this kind of therapy. I think that it's very important for us in the rehab world to have very, very clear what the outcomes are that we want to measure. And then we have the robotic devices. The robotic devices, they can be simple actuators that they can just uh, elevate um, the, the arm uh, or they can really actuate and, and help the patient to get into a movement that they were not able to, uh, to do. And this can really enhance and intensify the therapy because uh, it has been shown that uh, they are able to deliver a very high number of repetitions in shorter um, uh, period of time, um, showing in some cases superiority to the, um, to the uh, conventional therapy. Um, well, um, I'm gonna start talking now about uh, TDCS. I'm not sure if everybody knows what uh, transcranial direct current stimulation is, but um, it's just um, many, many devices that are out there. But uh, the, uh, the schematic is you put an electrode um, in one side of the brain, a return electrode in the other side of the brain on another location, and there is a, a very weak current passing from one electrode to the other. This, uh, this weak um, uh, path of electricity can change cortical excitability, and these changes uh, can be detected by um, EEG and by functional MRI. There are more and more now, um, I'm gonna pass this again, I just love the movement, um, models um, to assess where the current goes. Uh, like for example, here the blue will be where there's a decreased current and the red will be where the current has been increased. So this will allow us to focus um, the, or the tar to target better what part of the brain do we want to, um, to, uh, to stimulate. Um, there are many, and I'm not going to get into it because this will be like another talk. There are many, many different types of, um, of electro types and uh, montages, so that will allow us just to stimulate any part of the of the brain that uh, that we want. There are many many studies now uh, for many years. This technique has been studied, 
uh, because of his um, very low risk and safety um, pro profile. Um, and now it's known that it's safe, low risk, um, therapeutic method to improve not only neurological conditions, but also psychiatric conditions. And uh, it has been shown um, as a pretty good uh, alternative treatment for patients who, we, who might be unresponsive to other uh, methods or, or more traditional uh, interventions. Um, some of the things that, I, uh, that, uh, that this technique allows us is that uh, it uh, allows us to, it's a system that uh, will uh, let us do uh, brain stimulation and uh, brain signaling monitoring. So this will lead us to, uh, to do home-based therapies. It will lead us to do some personalized brain stimulation. And not only that, we'll be able to, uh, to have uh, uh, the data accessible anytime and anywhere. So as I say there, we will be able to read and to write uh, the brain. Um, and this can be very handy. Um, in the current situation where uh, in, in some places in the planet, um, we're going back um, to a shelter in place um, and a lot of our patients for their um, pre-condition, uh, pre-existing conditions, they, uh, they need to stay home and they're not, um, there's a too high a risk to come to our centers, they're able to do this kind of, uh, of therapies uh, at home. Another thing that uh, it's very interesting for us when using these, uh, these kind of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation devices is that um, when we want to study children's brain where they are moving around and playing and doing rehabilitation, this kind of, uh, of hats that they have EEG and TDCS all included uh, will allow us to do that. We're about to open a center where we are gonna have a program called Therapy is Play. Um, so we're gonna be studying um, people, well, little children with, um, with cerebral palsy. So just to try to investigate what is the better, um, what are the better neurorehabilitation um, outcomes for them. In order to do that, and since we were able to create a new center, um, we contacted a studio elsewhere. Um, Miral Phillips is the CEO of this, uh, of this uh, center. She's the artist that is gonna create this center for us. And I'm showing you this because this is how it's gonna look like um, where we're gonna um, stimulate and uh, do therapy to our kids. So the kids are gonna be having the, uh, the TDCS cap on. We're gonna be able to be monitoring the EEG constantly and applying the TDCS, and the TDCS when needed while they're playing video games and, and gamification um, uh, programs in these big screens um, over here. The studio elsewhere, um, they're experts in creating uh, spaces that, uh, well, they call it healing spaces because um, we need to understand a little bit better how our environment um, can, can enhance uh, the recovery. So this is a very exciting project that um, this year. About non-invasive brain stimulation as a quadruant um, uh, motor rehabilitation strategy. And I said quadruant because um, I do believe that uh, it doesn't matter how much you stimulate um, a brain that has been damaged, unless you are using another um, combination of strategies, um, it's not going to work. Let me tell you a little bit what has been the, um, the number of publications that, uh, and, well, the increase actually of PubMed publications um, for the last, uh, well, since 1990. Um, this, the last um, record was uh, set at uh, September 2019, and we went from less than 200 publications in 2006 to over um, 1,200 publications uh, last year. So there's a lot of interest <clears throat> um, from the scientific community, from the, uh, from the clinicians, and also from the, from the users, I will say later, um, and 
that there are more and more and more clinical trials using TCS per year going to last two years ago, there were like about uh, over 120. So a lot of people, they are doing it. A lot of people are investigating what are the best practices uh, to use this kind of technologies that they're kind of easy and they have shown somehow effects uh, in motor recovery. But um, let me just um, go through a few examples of how it can be used and what is the evidence that they have shown. In the, in the past years, we have done many studies using um, combination of TDCS and uh, uh, by itself or with motor training. Um, one of the things for those of you working with the spinal cord injury people that they have quadriplegia, so they have cervical level injury, they cannot move from their uh, neck down, is that uh, their priority is the use of their hands. Right, so we decided to target with TDCS the area of the brain, the M1, that targets the hand. Um, and um, we did a, um, a shank control study with using only one session to see after one session of TDCS how was if, if there was any change of in the grasping activity of our patients with quadriplegia. In order to calculate the grasping, we didn't use functional scales. Well, we did use them, but there were not differences, but we did use robotic devices. And we show that uh, there was a significant uh, improvement in grass uh, main peak. So in the movement, it's in the smoothness of the, of the movement when grasping, when using uh, TDCS. This was in chronic um, spinal cord injury patients. We decided then, um, having that uh, proof, that um, we decided to do a like, combined brain stimulation and hand robotic training in these kind of patients. So we asked them to come three times per week to six weeks, and we separated them. We randomized them in a in a sham and a two milliam uh, intensity TDCS group. What happened was that. Um, the patients that they were in the in the real TDCS group, they improve their uh, their function, their hand function, doing the box and block test that is picking up uh, boxes from one side to another. Um, not only after they finish the uh, the 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 brain stimulation and robotic training, but also in a six week uh, follow up. And while the the sham group didn't have um, didn't have that uh, significant increase. However, we have done TDCS in other populations and in other areas of the brain. So that was targeting the hand area um, in uh, people with spinal cord injury. We did um, a few years back with a group in Barcelona in the Goodman Institute, we did a TDCS study with robotic assisted gait training in people with subacute stroke. We did uh, see that after um, the training period, the combined training period, with we have a group that had TDCS targeting the leg area, so over the vertex, the anovular stimulation. Um, another group that has TDCS in the hand area that has nothing to do with the training that we were doing. So it was like a control group. And then we had another group that had no TDCS. It was like the sham, like the, the sham group. Um, everybody improved. This is in subacute stroke patients. Everybody, um, improve and there were no differences in between uh, in between groups not in the functional ambulatory category not uh, uh, that this is this one uh, not in the uh, in the goit velocity so we have you know sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work uh, in a much larger study because that was a study that we did with um, let's call it like low number of patients it was less than 20 in each group this was uh, we tested 82 um, chronic stroke patients in this study. Um, and this is an upper extremity um, training study combined with TDCS. There was, a, after three months of training, there was an increase, an improvement in the full major in, the, in these patients. Um, but there were no differences um, in between the real uh, TDCS and the sham TDCS. Uh, however, those improvements, they persist after six months after we finish the training. What it is, you know, it says something about um, um, how important it is, it is the activity-dependent plasticity, right? I mean, the training 
robotic training, any kind of training, it does something even in chronic stages. Um, but uh, but there were not uh, significant differences in uh, in uh, in the group. So TCS, it looked like it did not um, go to uh, to increase uh, that motor recovery in these patients. So we did. Um, so we were wondering, yeah, right? Because um, if you have a review, if you do like a little review of the literature, you will see that there are like many, many articles that they say it's fantastic, it really works. And some others, they are like, they're um, this percentage of responders. Um, so you need to be careful. So why did this happen? I think that it's very important for, for us to understand who are the people that can benefit the most for this type of uh, of, uh, of strategies, right? Um, so one of the things that we discover in a, in a post-analysis that we did in this past uh, um, study that we did is that the, when we studied the corticospinal activity or integrity assessed by TMS, the transcranial magnetic stimulation that it tells you what is the, the, the integrity of the, uh, of the corticospinal tract, giving you this MEP, the motor work potential, um, we determined that uh, that uh, the TMS, this MEP, is a predictor of clinically meaningful response to this intensive arm therapy in chronic st um, stroke, um, meaning that maybe not everybody that uh, that needs to have brain stimulation. To have brain stimulation in a patient that doesn't have a neuro um, um, neurological um, a substract that you can um, stimulate or you can enhance, it might not make much sense. So a little bit of how we can do brain stimulation work. Um, we need to really understand better what is the dose, what are the number of sessions. Not everybody has like a different number in place and sometimes it's not based in a, in, um, in scientific basis or in, in animal models, it's just whatever it is you can do in the clinic. We should try to um, avoid these kind of practices because um, it might hurt really um, the, um, the brain stimulation um, um, world. We need to really understand how long um, we do need to, to, uh, to be stimulating these patients. So. Uh, just to try to understand what is going to be the long-term adaptation. So um, if I do 20 sessions, um, that's going to last six months or, or uh, it's 10 sessions enough. Who the subject selection. I think that it's very important to do a full, to try to understand better um, what are the groups that we are studying. Um, historically, we have divided our patients um, by function. Maybe it is time to start dividing our patients in, um, in uh, anatomical structures. Presence or absence of MEPs, for example, um, it can be one of them. Where it's very, very important to, do, to, to know where do we need to, uh, to, uh, to target that stimulation. And now um, the, the new electrodes, they, they really allow to do like more targeted stimulation when the timing of the combined therapies is very important. When do you apply the TDCS, if it's before, during, or after, it has an effect in the, in the function uh, afterwards. Um, I think that we all should be thinking about um, precision rehabilitation. And I always refer to this um, because I would really like to see, and I would like to treat uh, rehabilitation as a, um, as we treat cancer patients. Um, we need to understand better who are the responders and who are the no responders. We need to try to make a little bit more effort in trying to investigate the predictors of motor recovery. I think that uh, there's a lot to be said in between the interaction between the brain and the spinal plasticity in, uh, in, um, in motor recovery. Um, so spinal circuitry should be something that we should investigate and add to, uh, to our outcomes. Um, I really believe that neurophysiology should guide rehabilitation. Um, if there is really like this, this balance in, in this um, stroke approach they show you at the beginning where one hemisphere is much more excited than the another one, we need to study this um, for each neurological disorders and treat it like if it was like one disorder or, or one individual and uh, just have the, the exact 
those for that individual. Um, I would really like um, for us to develop new and more objective and more sensitive outcome measures. I believe that technology, new sensors, robotic devices, they are giving us like more accurate kind of uh, outcomes. And that's very important um, because sometimes um, functional, um, functional skills, questionnaires, they are not really capturing um, changes. And then I cannot like, um, um, put more emphasis in this. We need multidisciplinary teams, work with engineers, work with people that they, are, they have other specialties to try to understand better what is going on. Um, we have done a lot of research into it, and uh, by now there are practical guides to do transcranial direct current stimulation in, um, in, in mm, neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders and they are evidence-based guidelines um, so everybody can uh, can see in these reviews and these guidelines what is the level of evidence for each different uh, disorder so you know I invite you all um, to uh, to read them if you are going to uh, to start studying uh, TDC as so a brain stimulation in uh, in humans we do know by now that uh, that TDCS can really change cortical excitability. Um, we know that uh, we can target different uh, areas in the brain. We can model the current to know exactly where it's going. And, uh, and uh, with the new electrodes, we can be more or less focal as, uh, as is needed. It's safe, it's low risk, and, uh, and it has shown a very good promise uh, in improving neurological and psychiatric conditions. So, you know, we need to be responsible of doing good research, but I will definitely encourage everybody to, uh, to try it. Um, in the last uh, two minutes that I have, um, I would like to bring to everybody's attention how TDCS has been also used, has been moved from the laboratory to the wider community, right? And this has been uh, seen with a lot of do-it-yourself kind of uh, devices that uh, I would not encourage anybody to use them. Um, I don't think that it's a trivial thing to put currents into somebody's brain, but it is true that there's a, there's a willingness to try, right? Um, so um, we do know that you know, TDCS can really change or modulate brain physiology, cognitive functions, and behavior. So a lot of people have been using it for human performance. We were approached by Red Bull um, and the high performance team to try to investigate uh, how the brain of an elite athlete work. So we opened for the first time um, a human performance division that really focuses here in Mount Sinai on a, a athletic and executive performance. So we understand human performance as a spectrum. So it goes, it goes not only from, uh, from people with disabilities to also athletes. And we do know that human performance, so how we behave um, in life when we want to do a task, um, it has many different variables. And there are all of them, I'm not gonna read them, but uh, it goes from inspiration and motivation to genetics. So um, we were very fortunate to work uh, with, the, um, with the Red Bull team to try to investigate if uh, non-invasive brain stimulation, TDCS, could uh, change the uh, central fatigue of uh, elite athletes. Um, a team of scientists, uh, um, over 25 scientists, uh, we met in, uh, in LA to analyze the neurophysiological responses to brain stimulation uh, to try to, uh, to understand if these athletes can, can uh, why they will stop or, or slow down when, the, when they were uh, tired. So I'm gonna show you just uh, a few pictures of, uh, of that uh, really amazing um, study that we did. We only studied four athletes over a week. Uh, we put them, uh, this is me, we're doing some uh, uh, EEG, recording in the athletes after they have done um, um, fatigue exercises. Uh, we did use uh, TMS assessment to assess what was the, the motor of potential the responses uh, that they had. And, uh, and you use uh, electrodes all over the place um, to assess all those responses. This is one of the, uh, of the tests that they were doing. 
uh, these are endurance, endurance um, athletes and it was really um, a great, like an amazing experience to investigate them. Since there were only four patients, it was just a, like a, like a uh, like, uh, serious, um, um, it, sorry, uh, there were only four patients. So the sham control study that we did didn't show superiority of the TDCS to see if we could decrease the uh, fatigue in these patients. But again, it's like a case series. So it doesn't have like a, a lot of uh, enough evidence to say it doesn't work. It's something that, you know, it's open to, uh, to investigation. And, uh, and I think that there's a lot to, to learn there, not only for athletes, but also for patients. Um, I would like just to finish this saying that um, we need to uh, add to our current rehabilitation strategies for motor recovery, novel technologies that they are effective, cost effect, efficient, time efficient, and they are accessible for everybody. Um, we do need to investigate more and novel stimulation paradigms. Um, a lot of people there are doing it. Maybe we should try to encourage more multi, um, multi-center studies so we can do the research uh, together um, so we can go faster to places. And I really believe that uh, artificial intelligence, it could be used in the, in the future, in the near future to personalize these stimulation protocols and optimize how effective they are. Um, I hope that, uh, that uh, you have learned a little bit uh, with, uh, with this talk. I just want to uh, finish with a little bit of inspiration. Um, on Friday, we uh, woke up uh, knowing that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg from the Supreme, Supreme uh, Court Justice um, passed. Um, she was really fierce in fighting for women's rights until um, her death on September 18. Um, and she, um, funny enough, she worked with a personal trainer in the Supreme Court exercise room until you know months before um, she passed. She really understood how important it was uh, to get a healthy brain to uh, be a healthy person. And not only that, she also knew the importance of giving women a voice and to give them a seat on the table so we will be able to, uh, to be part of the decision uh, process. Uh, on light on, on that and to avoid discrimination bias in scientific conferences, Kate Hoy uh, created this Roman in, Women in Brain Stimulation database for uh, female scientists working on brain stimulation. So if you're a woman and you are uh, working on brain stimulation, please, um, sign up uh, so we can um, start uh, a collaboration between female scientists um, and we can start talking about the importance of, uh, of having mentors. Thank you very much for giving this time to me, for giving me, you know, a voice um, to, uh, to talk about my message. And if anybody has questions, I will be happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Mar, for an excellent presentation. Uh, actually, I was uh, now quickly checking our attendees uh, and based on the first name, I think we, we have 60% uh, women participation and 40, 40 men. So, so women participation in this webinar is a majority, at least. Yay. So, well, you can continue like this. <laughs> we have, it's a continuous work. <laughs> it's a uh, continuous Sorry, we, we do have a few questions and actually they were coming uh, when you were um, doing the presentation. So they yeah. may refer to some slides from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and the first, first question is from Salem uh, regarding TDCS at uh, what extent is effective uh, TDCS in stroke and especially in uh, stroke patients. And I would here generalize more this question asking, um, which is the phase in stroke to apply TDCS, uh, the, the correct one or the best one, acute, subacute, or, or chronic, based on your experience? I wish, I wish if I knew. So many years of studying it and we still don't know. Um, I will say that um, more and more efforts are being done in, in doing brain stimulation um, right after the injury, right in subacute stages. But um, um, it is true that uh, a lot of the efforts they have been trying to get the attention into, uh, into chronic stages because it's so much easier to determine what is the value 
of, uh, of the increase or the change uh, of this motor function or any function that you are studying um, when, uh, when the patient has plateau, right? What happened in the early stages is that um, we don't fully understand how spontaneous recovery occurs in the stroke patients. Um, so when you apply any kind of intervention, it can be robotics, it can be brain stimulation or both, um, unless the delta of the change in a shame control study, it's really big um, in the control um, um, group, um, it's very complicated to determine how much of that improvement it was not due to the, to the spontaneous recovery. However, I must say that uh, we were thinking about doing a, um, a multi-center study here to try to investigate not only how brain stimulation can improve, but also what are the neurophysiological markers of these early stages of a stroke to to, to be able to tell the patients what the prognostic is going to be. For example, um, there are studies now that we know that uh, the presence of MEP responses in, uh, in the first week after the stroke, it has a positive, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, the pronostic is much better than patients that they don't have an, uh, an MEP response. Um, so it's, you know, it's a line of, of investigation that it's ongoing. And also since the profile of the, um, of the TDCS is so safe, it's, uh, it's worth doing this kind of uh, early stages um, um, studies. So I will definitely, you know, like uh, tell everybody to please, uh, you know, go ahead and do, and do them. Okay, thank you very much. Next question is from Kate. Um, how to do the stimulation at home? How to monitor the patient treatment and how many patients can be treated at once uh, in one point of time? Um, so with, uh, with this neuro neuroelectric device, with this hat that I was showing to you, there is, um, you can contact the company. I, I don't have the home base device, but uh, you can, you know, you can have that uh, device for you. So what you do is, um, the device has a different, um, it has like different electrodes that you can just preset and have them just set. And uh, the patient just need to, you know, like put the electrodes, put some gel in the electrodes or use sponge electrodes or whatever, just put the hat on and the doctor from home or from, from sorry, from the hospital or from whatever, um, it will determine when the stimulation will happen. Okay, it will be like kind of a having, sorry, like a virtual visit. Um, so you as a doctor, as a scientist, as a researcher, will be controlling um, what is the stimulation time, the duration, and everything that is happening um, at home. Um, there are a few studies, home-based studies now going on. Uh, so, I mean, everything is out there, and not only for motor recovery. I, I'm not sure even if there is something for motor recovery, but definitely there are, there are studies uh, out there for uh, for uh, psychiatric conditions, like uh, attention deficit for kids and stuff like that. Um, okay, so. okay, thank you, thank you. I, I think we have to go uh, with very short uh, answer, Mar, sorry, because we have Wait, many I questions, so we'll try. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and a uh, question from Martes. Um, how we can combine actually different techniques? I mean, if, uh, and if this could be effective, TDCS, as you were mentioning, TDCS, um, virtual uh, stimulation, video games, sensor technology, robotics. Uh, and so the question is, uh, if we could combine all these techniques at one patient and uh, if this would be, would be more effective. Well, um, th there's not short answer for that. <laughs> I really believe that uh, when you do, when you combine different different strategies, um, you need to. Mm, it, it doesn't need to be symbiotic, meaning that um, it's not. It's it doesn't sum. It's not going up. Actually, I have, I have a very nice slide here, and if I can share it, yes. Um, so here, um, Langd, that it's a physical therapist that they have done a lot of work with uh, with um, TACS and the brain stimulation. She was um, she published that uh, when you prime the brain, when you do two different types of stimulation, for example, um, 
depending of uh, of when you do it, right? Be, uh, uh, and the type of stimulation that you do, it will determine where it goes, the excitability. So you cannot assume that um, the same kind of stimulation or, or, or no stimulation, the two different things that work, for example, robotic works, um, um, this delta amount, um, the stimulation works, this delta amount, if I put them together, it's gonna be two eyes, this effect, this effect that doesn't work like that. And it's not only that, I might say that um, each neurological condition it needs to be studied separately because a lot of the studies that uh, they have done, they have been done in brain stimulation, they are in healthy subjects. When the, when the brain gets injured, it works differently. So it's not as easy as it seems, but it can be done. Okay, okay be thank done. you. So, so, so regarding, regarding the, the combined stimulation, uh, another question from Martes, regarding the timing. So if you apply the task, if you have any clue when to stimulate, for example, with TDCS of TMS before the task, during the task, after the task, what could be more, more effective? There are a lot of groups that they have been studying that. Um, in, in our center, um, we decided to do, the, to do the stimulation before the task. Um, and it's because um, in some animal models, they have been shown that if you prime the brain, if you stimulate the brain before doing any kind of manual task, it's better that if you do it during. So clinically, it makes like more sense to put the TCS device and to have the person doing speech therapy or doing robotic therapy. So you can actually do it in, in the training period, right? Otherwise you need to add 20 minutes uh, to that training protocol. Um, but uh, there were some studies that they were showing that there's like a competition um, going on when you are doing the, stimulate, the stimulation and you are activating the... Uh, that pathway at the same time. So the idea is to prime the brain before and then do the task um, in the area or of the area that you were stimulating. It can be like, you know, speech therapy, as I say, it can be like manual therapy or anything like that. Exactly, thank you very much. Uh, next question from Mastane. Uh, I probably miss it, but what is the definition of the corticospinal integrity? This was found to be a predictor, I guess the predictor of, of the effectiveness of treatment. Yeah, so the corticospinal um, integrity, is, um, it's measured by the TMS, by the transcranial magnetic stimulation. The transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's a coil that you put um, over the M1, the motor cortex, and with surface electrodes, when you apply the stimulation, you will get a biphasic wave. When you measure the, the peak to peak um, amplitude of that wave, it will give you the motor about potential. Changes in that amplitude has been shown to reflect changes in corticospinal excitability. Okay, so the greater the MEP, the greater the excitability. So um, in our group, for example, a lot of the studies that we use, we have neurophysiology as one of the outcomes. We have neurophysiology, we have clinical and functional scales, and then quality of life scales, for example. Plus, you know, you can have then, you know, like um, BDNF testing, genetics, whatever it is that, whatever it is that you want. But the corticospinal tract, um, I think that it's very important. And in, and in the stroke rehabilitation, it has been shown to be a major player in recovery. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question from Bernardo regarding the study about the impact of TDCS on gait. Did you assess the effect on kinematic, kinetics, and EMG measures? Thanks for the presentation. That was, that was a very good question. We did not in that study. Um, we didn't have back in the, that this was done in the Goodman Institute and uh, we used the gate training and the locomat, um, that there are like two different um, devices that, uh, that allow to do gate training, people with, uh, with strokes, spinal cranial, et cetera. Um, there was not, uh, EMG um, done in the in the legs to assess, you know, if um, if they were getting stronger, right? If you they were able to have like a better contraction, and um, they were not, uh, they were, I don't think, I don't remember, no, but they were they were not uh, kinematics and kinetics from uh, from the devices. We just uh, reported 
uh, functional scales like the 10 meter walk and uh, and the quality of uh, of of gait with the with the FAC with the FAC FAC sorry. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Christina: Is it true that functional clinical measures may not be sensitive enough, but sensors might actually give us too detailed information, which may not be clinically meaningful? What are your absolutely. thoughts about it? Absolutely. I mean, she's absolutely right. Um, as a scientist, we need to be very careful with this um, because sometimes some of the interventions that we do they are so small that um, that they don't have any clinical relevance, right? I mean, why is, what is the point for me to be stimulating a part of the brain so small that only it's able to characterize um, the, the, the corticospinal tract of, of, you know, of the finger area? If my, if my patient is able to move the finger, one finger better, the quali his quality of life, her quality of life, it not, it's not gonna be enough. So I agree. Like, that's why the, the, the big funding agencies, they want improvement in quality of life, improvement in clinical function. However, to do proof of principle studies, you do need measurements that they are sensitive enough to do those proof of principle. For example, to, to be able in a chronic patient, to be able to, 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 uh, to reorganize the spare connections that they are left, even to get a minor change, that is a lot. Because uh, in chronic in chronic stages, not I mean uh, nobody does anything. So if that can be amplified, that is really really important. That's why I think that we need to um, and and now it's very easy. We need to implement more uh, and put more technology inside our centers. Now I mean our phones are able to tell us um, all the vital signs, you know, I mean, why don't incorporate this in our research studies? I think that the combination between the both, it's, um, it's how things should be done. Okay, perfect, thank you. Another question from Joanna. Would you say TMS should be used in uh, spinal cord injury patients before attempting rehabilitation strategies as well? Would it work in the same way to check that the cortical spinal tract is intact? I would say yes. So we did a study with TMS, um, and uh, there is this thing with, with patients with a spinal cord injury, right? Um, when you do uh, the ACI scale uh, and you determine if they are complete or incomplete, that is the major prognostic and, uh, uh, for the patient, right? Uh, a complete patient that doesn't have any, any spare connection below the level of the injury, you will put that patient to, do, to get adapted to that new reality. You will not put their efforts in trying to get back function like in patients that they have in, incomplete lesions. However, TMS studies, they have shown that 50% of those complete patients, they have preserved corticospinal uh, tract responses to TMS, 50%, it's half of them. So half of those patients that they, we are just adapting for them, you know, to live uh, as quadriplegic or paraplegics in a, in a wheelchair, we should be putting all our efforts in trying to strengthen those, uh, those pathways that they are still there. So I would say definitely, definitely yes. Okay, thank you very much. Another question from Tiago. Dr. Cotes, thank you for your presentation. I wonder to know about the possible plastic mechanisms related to TDC, TCCS and spinal injury. Is it possible to imagine an anterograde mechanism like stimulating the brain, we can improve spinal connections, or should we think about new cortical mapper organization for improving motor performance? I think that both. So what happened with, with TDCS is that, um, so there are two things. When you do TMS, repetitive TMS, um, there, there is a body that goes, you know, um, from the cortex to the muscle and back up. When you do TDCS, there's a weak um, um, current going from one part of the brain to another, or even you know to um, to an extracephalic um, location. It does work. Both work in uh, in creating neural changes. Uh, in the brain. And I believe that the changes, the neural changes of the organization happen in these mappings. Um, I've done a few mapping studies with TMS. They occur when you are 
when you add this this activity dependent plasticity right when you're doing this rehabilitation uh, even with patients with um with quadriplegia for example you know that uh people that they are they they don't have um oh leg uh leg function when you do the mapping the the map of the hand it's going medial to the area of the leg right um so um I will say that in patients with the spinal cord injury, it will be very, very interesting to do not only brain stimulation, but also other type of stimulation. I will pair central stimulation with afferent stimulation, with electrical stimulation to the muscle, because that kind of stimulation also, it can change the, the, motor, the motor mapping. I don't think that one, one type of stimulation, um, it's necessary. And in something as complex as spinal cord injury, um, um, now more and more groups are doing central stimulation, spinal stimulation, and peripheral stimulation, so triple stimulation. It's all like, you know, it's all on the works. Okay. But it's Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, another question from Anna actually related to this. Uh, thank you for your amazing presentation. My question is related to the structural changes in the mask of fibers. Uh, for, for, for the mask, muscle fibers for chronic patients, stroke or spinal cord injury. What is your opinion about the impact of new technologies on functional recovery in those patients with a high level of spasticity or even with changes in the muscle fiber length? Changes on muscle fiber length like shortening or fibrosis of soft tissues? Well, um, I always say that um, I mean, I treat a lot of patients that they have spasticity because I work with a lot of patients with the spinal cord injury and stroke. So um, uh, TMS, for example, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's, it's been used successfully. And I believe that TDCS has been done it too, to treat spasticity. The exact changes that they happen in the muscle, I am not sure. But uh, I like to think of spasticity as, um, as a problem, inhibitory problem in the brain. I don't think that it's a problem of the muscle. I think that there is a mixed signal. Um, it's the central origin is what I'm getting at. Um, so I do, I, I do believe that, um, that uh, changing um, brain signaling will determine that that tone, it will be, you know, it will be decreased. Um, because despite the fact that, for example, you can do Botox, right? You can do like peripheral um, um, strategies. Um, they don't, they really don't last. So the problem is really not the muscle. The problem is that uh, there has been either a damage in the brain or a damage in between that um, communication between the brain and the muscle. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Somehow technical question, actually, uh, so far at uh, Mount Sinai, you are using eight channel stimulator device or 20 channels or 32, the question from Rodolfo. Is there any clinical oh. difference in the response? Hola, Rodolfo. Um, I'm, I have here, oh, yeah. I have the eight channel one. Is it the eight channel one? Have the channel one, but also the thing is that I don't. Um, so I'm not an EEG person. I do. I have done EEG um, studies with uh, with the device just because it's so easy to do it. But um, I have like an external um, uh, person doing all the analysis for me, and um, the the EEG people that they use the you know 62 channels, 100 and something channels. They are like ah okay. You know, if you want to do like a little study of, you know, how um, brain signaling is affected with TCS, this is enough. Um, and I, I've used in my studies always the A channel one, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think this was almost the last question if you are running out of time. There are some questions regarding specific applications like in epilepsy, neurogenerative disorders in children. So um, I would say, please stay tuned for the next webinars because we will be inviting uh, people from different fields and from differ with different applications. 
actually the next one would, would be related to neurodegenerative disorders with uh, Alzheimer's disease and frontal, frontotemporal dementia. Uh, so stay tuned to, to, our, to our next webinars. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mar, for being with us uh, today. We are very happy and- uh, It's been fun, thanks. <laughs> And if anybody has any questions, um, just you know, email me. I believe that um, my email was um, well, Mark Cortez is very easy. Mark Cortez Monsign, I, I believe that there is only one. Um, I'll be very happy to uh, to get in touch and to uh, to answer any questions that you guys might have. Be careful, Mark, because you can get hundreds of emails tomorrow <laughs> in your box. Then we but, need to uh, we need to work together. Otherwise, you okay, know, okay. I have patients that need to treat. So. We need to get this thing done. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank thanks you. for the presentation. Uh, thanks for all questions. Uh, thanks uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, there were questions regarding the offline version of the webinar. Yes, the webinar has been recorded and then will be available in the offline version. Um, I hope you will join us again for the next webinars. Uh, so stay tuned for the next webinar with the information on our webpage, neuroelectrics.com, then we'll provide you the information regarding the next date. And once again, thank you very much. Have a great day and take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.